Jean Harlow is cinema's first platinum blonde icon, a mixture of innocence and sensuality that predates Marilyn Monroe. William Powell was the paradigm of the urban, suave, and courteous American gentleman at ease in all situations. Their romance spanned over barely three years, death having swept away Jean Harlow in 1937 at just 26 years old. Yet, they remain one of the most iconic couples of Hollywood's golden age. A romance with a tragic Shakespearean flair. It began as an irresistible attraction of polar opposites between the actor and the embodiment of the 1930s woman born Harleen Carpenter. She was born March 3rd, 1911, in Kansas City, Missouri, and her mother was Jean Harlow Carpenter, and her father was Dr. Montclair Carpenter. He was a dentist. Uh, her parents divorced when she was nine years old, and Jean lived with her mother. The divorce of Harleen's parents was a, not only a, a difficult, it was almost a traumatic experience for her because she had a strong bond with her father. So when she was pulled away from her father, deprived of his company, his guidance, his love, it created a, a vacuum in her life, a, a, a need, a want. So she sought a replacement father. Most of her relationships, her second husband, her third husband, her final great love, William Powell, were father surrogates. She called William Powell Poppy. That was her name for him. So she was always looking for a father. William Powell was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 1892, in the 19th century, to a normal working class family. He graduated high school in 1910. He didn't feel comfortable maybe possibly being a lawyer or businessman of some kind. I think deep inside he was an art, had an artistic heart. And somebody said to him that, you know, uh, why don't you try it out to see about if you want to be in any kind of dramatic arts. He tried it out and uh, immediately went to get to work. He started in vaudeville. Vaudeville was a form of stage entertainment that was sort of lighthearted and comedies that would be sort of the infancy of silent films. He, like many of the other ones, became a real serious working actor in stock. And that stock means that they do many plays. They, do, uh, they have a slate of maybe eight plays. And that they would each be in, the, learn the lines from different characters in each different play, mind you. This was serious work and then eventually ending up on Broadway and playing co-starring roles or, or character roles. In other words, really learning his trade. After the divorce, Jean Harlow's mother, having always felt trapped in the Midwest, decided to try her luck in Los Angeles, bringing her daughter. When they arrived, roughly 1920, there was a, about 100 studios, and there were also numerous fan magazines that propagated interest in the films being made and especially in the stars. Now her plan was that she would become a star, but she was too old. She was probably born about a decade too early. Had she been born a decade later, she could have had a career for herself in the movies. Short of money, young Harleen and her mother leave Hollywood and settle down in Chicago. Her mother remarried again, Marino Bello, who was an, of Italian descent. He seemed to be sort of, um, I don't know, he had the looks of a gangster. 
He was suave and debonair and Italian in her mind. He was sort of like aristocracy, which of course he wasn't at all. He was a waiter in a Chicago hotel. But she elevated him to that level because then she could elevate herself. But there was something sinister about him and his attention to Harleen discomforted her and she wanted to get away. She got married when she was 16 and she married Charles McGrew who was a wealthy Chicago society person. She wanted to create her own life and go off and start her own family. The second time Jean Harlow went to Hollywood, her husband took her to get away from her mother because he had family out in Beverly Hills and he thought, well, if I take her out there, we can get away from her mother. They lived very well. They had a nice little house and they had plenty of money. And Charles McGrew didn't work because he lived off his inheritance from his parents. So they lived quite um, a plush uh, lifestyle. The two were right to enjoy their luxury, as Harleen's destiny is about to take a major turn. She actually got her first opportunity to work with uh, the studios by a, uh, a bet by one of her friends that dared her to go down to Central Casting and to try out for uh, roles. The casting director saw Harleen and he said, who is that? And that's what started it. And they called her the next day and they said, is Harleen Negru there? And she didn't know who it was. So they said, well, you have to register with Central Casting. What's your name? And she said, my name is Jean Harlow. She took her mother's name because it was the career her mother always wanted. Immediately, Mama Jean joins her daughter in Los Angeles to take charge of her career and her private life. Her mother promptly set about breaking that marriage up because she really liked Charles McGrew. And she became pregnant and her mother demanded that she abort the child and divorce Charles McGrew. And of course, she always, always obeyed her mother. At first, the only work that this newly christened Jean Harlow could find was an extra maybe bit player, but not enough to get credits. And it was really uh, at, at the Hal Roach comedies that she learned a lot of timing and from Stan Laurel, especially Laurel and Hardy, the, the comedy team. Double Whoopie was one of her famous two-reeler Laurel and Hardy comedies in 1929, where she plays a sophisticated lady stepping out of a taxi cab, only to have her dress get caught in the door. And Laurel and Hardy are the uh, doormen to the hotel. She was so striking that people said, who is that? They wanted to know more about her, so fan mail started coming to Hal Roach for the, the blonde girl. In New York, between two plays, William Powell did his own debut on the silver screen. He was already on Broadway for several years. He knew a lot of people. Many of the stage actors were being um, uh, recruited by the movie studios in New York City. His break came when John Barrymore got him a role in Sherlock Holmes. And forever after, William Powell would, would acknowledge and thank John Barrymore for that favor. Then finally, he got a contract with Paramount to come out to the West as well, and starts to work in many different films and leading up an, until the revolution of sound, of course. William Powell made 34 films during the silent era, between 1922 and 28. 
and in the majority of them he was a villain. And of course at the beginning a lot of them were, you know, small roles, so you could do 16 to 20 films a year. That's how Hollywood worked at that time. So while in Hollywood, his big break came in 1928. This is at the end of the silent era, the beginning of the sound era. He had a decent voice. Why? He had training on the stage. Them sound, the movies talk. Discs, them sound on film. And audiences that had watched silent lips suddenly heard dialogue. From Interference, William Powell with Evelyn Brent. Well then, for what it's worth to you, and what you're worth to me, I love you. This is the whole point. Many of the actors who succeeded in the film industry in the early days of sound were successful because they already had stage-trained voices. Everybody else who were in silent films who were not trained on the stage failed. They either had very bad accents or they couldn't project or they spoke from their necks, meaning like this or something like this, so it didn't work. He had a good voice. He, he would become successful. He had, his career was assured. The transition from silent to talkies would also change the course of Jean Harlow's career, leading her to millionaire and pilot Howard Hughes, who had just made a major film about the role of aviation in World War I. Howard Hughes poured his personal fortune into Hell's Angels. He took three years to shoot that movie. It started as a silent film. And then when sound came in, he decided to scrap it as a silent film and remake it as a talkie. But his leading lady was Norwegian and had a thick accent, Greta Nissen, so he had to recast the role. So he looked and he looked and he looked, but he was cheap, so he didn't want a name. Howard Hughes took a gamble because Jean Harlow was not an actress at this point. She really had no skill. And she could barely move from one side of the screen to the other. But he just felt that there was an electricity when she was on screen. Uh, she looked like no one else, and he just felt that this story, which was all men and all machines, needed sex. Hell's Angels, the opening of this picture at Raman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood, was the biggest premiere ever seen anywhere in the world in Jean Harlow. Thank you. I would like to use this occasion to publicly thank Mr. Hughes for the opportunity so suddenly, Jean Harlow, who's 19 years old, has gone from being a nobody into being this sensational new personality that has the whole publicity machine of Howard Hughes behind her. So she really becomes an overnight star. Hell's Angels really made Jean Harlow famous. But did it make her famous as an actress? No. As a star? No. As an oddity? Yes. she soon becomes a valued commodity. Still tied to Howard Hughes, she creates her own unique style. Jean Harlow came onto the scene as a blonde with this blazing white glory, halo of hair, and which was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. The name Platinum Blonde being applied to Jean Harlow was, came about kind of an accident that when her hair turned an odd color, when standard dyes, bleaches were used on it. And then they enhanced that with uh, Lux <laughs> flakes and ammonia and all kinds of horrible things. But, you know, it made her look like no one else. So of course, uh, when Columbia borrowed her for the Frank Capra film, they said, let's call it Platinum Blonde, make her the central feature of it. One film critic at the time noticed how in her movies you'd see girls in all the audiences with their hair dyed platinum blonde, just like Jean Harlow. She became their idol. In theory, it should have been men who loved her because she was so sexually alluring. And you would think women would look at that and say, well, that's the competition. I don't like that. That makes me feel less than. When in fact, women liked her just as much. And her appeal really crossed over. I think for the time of the Depression that there were so many people 
looking for a diversion from their situation in life, being unemployed or with the economy. And here comes this beautiful blonde sex symbol as it was. I think she got a lot more attention than one of the uh, other, than other previous sex symbols. Sex symbols go all the way back to uh, Betty Blythe as the Queen of Sheba, Theta Berra wearing nothing in 1917 when she played Cleopatra. I'm just, I swear, she's wearing nothing. She's, she's wearing this little pasty over her breasts, over her nipple, and a little snake. And that's all. Now, if that isn't a sex symbol, I don't know what is. Jean Harlow really was, you know, a, a sexy star and a sexy person. Not in a deliberately provocative way. She was more kind of innocently provocative. Jean Harlow didn't do it intentionally. That's just how she was. She just walked that way and acted that way. It was very at ease with her body. At this point, Jean Harlow's career takes another turn. Paul Byrne, the number three producer at MGM, decides to take the young actress under his wing. He was an advisor, he was a confidant, he took her places, but he did it with a lot of actresses. He did it with Joan Crawford, he did it with Norma Shearer. He was known as the father confessor of Hollywood who squired around all these screen beauties, but never touched them. And it was the best thing she felt that had ever happened to her because somebody who was one of the most respected men in Hollywood had shined a light on her and said, you matter, you're different, and he brought her over to MGM. MGM bought her contract from Howard Hughes. Jean Harlow shoots Red-Headed Woman for MGM, and eventually, her relationship with Paul Byrne changes. Paul Byrne asked her to marry him. And everyone said, you want to marry that old man? She's 21 and he's 42, and he's never been married. One of her friends went to her and said, you know, I don't think he's interested in consummating this marriage, thinking that she would dissuade Jean Harlow from marrying him. And Jean Harlow burst into tears and said, then it's true. He just wants me because he respects me. And that was enough for her. Mama Jean saw this as a wonderful opportunity for Jean to become connected with Paul Byrne because of all that he could do for her at uh, MGM Studios. All his influence would be quite good for her and her career. I don't think Jean Harlow married him for professional reasons. I think she married him hoping for love and respect. She could get sex anywhere. Everyone wanted to have sex with Jean Harlow. Not everyone wanted to love her. Now you could call that delusional, you could call that hopeful, you could call that poignant, and you could call that tragic. And it ended up being all of those things. On July 2nd, 1932, Jean Harlow and Paul Byrne get married. Jean Harlow did not want a massive Hollywood wedding, although the studio tried to convince her to do so. She got married in her mother and stepfather's house uh, with maybe a dozen of their closest friends. But the fairy tale that was John and Paul's romance comes to an abrupt end two months later while she's shooting a new picture. Came Labor Day weekend, they filmed the Saturday, and then Jean Harlow stayed with her mother on Sunday, and on Monday morning, Labor Day, uh, they got a frantic call from Paul Byrne's house. A frantic call from one of the help, one of the servants, saying that Paul Byrne was dead, gunshot wound. And the police were not called, but the MGM executives were called. And uh, it was a horrible scene. He was naked. and. Uh, the gun was underneath his body, so they, they kind of rearranged evidence. Did Paul Barron kill himself, or was he murdered, as some suggest? 
Above all, MGM executives seek to preserve the reputation of the studio. MGM had to craft a narrative to fit the fact that he died so suddenly and so surprisingly less than two months after the two of them were married. The narrative they decided upon was that Paul Byrne committed suicide because he couldn't satisfy Gene Harlow sexually because he was a sexual deviant and a pervert and impotent. And with Paul Byrne being dead, he became the scapegoat of being a bad man. And they were trying to save the career and the integrity of Gene Harlow. There was a feeling of she drove him to it. This sexually voracious woman that he married made him feel inadequate, and therefore he had to kill himself. But somehow, the press, the writers at the newspapers and fan magazines had met her and liked her. So they took her up her cause. And she was portrayed as a, a victim of this terrible circumstance. By all accounts, she was completely baffled. Why did he kill himself? Why would he do this terrible, horrible thing? She would cry and moan. She had no idea. And she never, ever discussed it to the day she died. She would not discuss it. So when you hear people saying, she told me this, she told me that about Paul Byrne, they're not telling the truth because she told no one. While Jean Harlow finds herself widowed at 21 years old, William Powell is in love with one of the most known stars of Hollywood. When he was at Paramount at the beginning of the sound era, he was contracted to do Man of the World and then Ladies' Man, in which he was co-starred with Carol Lombard, who was the big, important Paramount star there at that time. They had a chemistry going there, and uh, uh, it seemed successful. And not only that, the chemistry was off screen as well, and he married her in 1931. They were quite the uh, opposites <laughs> in, in character-wise, I think. She uh, was known to say whatever was on her mind, and she had um, the vocabulary of a truck driver, is what a lot of people <laughs> told her. It was a rough and down-to-earth uh, way of speaking, which is pretty much the opposite of uh, William Powell being a, a suave and sophisticated. The marriage only lasted two years, because as he said, I was Mr. Carol Lombard, and you don't want to marry someone that half of America wants to sleep with. At the end of 1932, Jean Harlow is 21 years old, and her comeback on screen with Red Dust is a big smash, beating previous records. One more occurrence like this, and you live in that shack across the river. I will not, and if you think I'd give a this was a pre-code film, meaning that there was some very uh, hot sexual kind of innovations going on in here in which she wears, she's practically wearing nothing. She's in this bath and here he is with his shirt open and he looks great. And there's this animal uh, sexual tension going on. Red dust was hot. You're always in that color? Mm-hmm, always been a tailhead. And you always shut your face off that way? Well, I like that. Clark Gable was a big, brawny, all-American man, and Jean Harlow was a curvaceous, loud-mouthed American woman. And they were a new archetype in films, and they fascinated the public. It was the dawn of a new generation. Hollywood was in search of new faces, but William Powell still hadn't found his place at Paramount. He was really a trooper for years without being noticed. Paramount didn't have the right product for him. He just didn't fit well. He was playing bad guys a lot or, or playing the interesting characters, but not, nothing unusual. William Powell still trying to find his way until what happens is that Warner Brothers raids Paramount's stars. They got William Powell, Kay Francis, Ruth Chatterton, and then Warner Brothers doesn't know quite what to do with him after they've stolen him from Paramount.
Why, this man's a detective. A detective? Of course. He's a private detective. Yes, Janet, I am a private detective. And Warner Brothers dropped him. And his career was considered to be over. He was almost 40 years old. Playing on the nefarious aspect of Jean Harlow, MGM offers her a role for their picture, Bombshell. MGM thought, okay, let's really capitalize on her, this, give her a story about a movie star. But the, they cleverly chose the life of Clara Bow and her crazy life as a star and having no privacy and having men you know, uh, after her for her money and her fame. Essentially, it's Jean Harlow. She has parasitic parents. Her father in the movie is just using her just like Jean Harlow's stepfather was, her mother. And, and people who worked on Bombshell told me that they would go to the set and there would be Jean Harlow's mother and stepfather, the mother in furs and the stepfather in spats with a cane, and just watching the movie all day long, doing nothing. They didn't work, they just took her money. I dubbed you the Hollywood Bombshell, and that's the way they like you. Men, scrapes, dazzling clothes, a gorgeous pinwheel personality, not patting babies on the back to bring up bubbles. But turbulent waters lie ahead for the new MGM star. She built her career around audacious films, but in Hollywood, things are about to change. A lot of those movies were very erotic, weren't they? You know, a lot of those movies, the best Jean Harlow movies are the ones that were made before 1934, because she could go without a bra, and she could say things she wasn't able to say after that. So that when the Hayes Code really got its teeth, it changed careers. Will Hayes, he established a production code of do's and don'ts for future productions. The Hayes Code was um, kind of a last-ditch effort of Hollywood not to be censored by outside agencies. And in 1934, they really cracked down on what you could show, what could be seen in movies, what could be implied in movies. What this meant for Jean Harlow and for Mae West, Norma Shearer, numerous other actresses, was that their characters could no longer be prostitutes, had to, uh, if there was uh, adultery in a story, it had to be paid for at the end of the film. There had to be someone in the film telling them what you're doing is morally wrong. And also, the costumes they could wear could, had to be less revealing. Once the production code was instituted, Jean Harlow was such a big star and such a valuable property to MGM that they had to figure out what to do with her. She had a quality that nobody else seemed to have, which was she could make sex funny. She could make you laugh with her and at her at the same time. And when you make sex funny and it becomes a comedy, it's less censorable. So it wasn't really a question of changing the characters she played as much as combining who she really was with the characters she played. So they changed her hair color to something they called brownette, and they still made her play aggressive girls, but they were aggressive girls with a heart of gold who really were good. Oh, I knew he wouldn't come. I'm all the big Welsh and small head and low eyes that I Dutch! Take what you need from my closet and I'll watch out for the cop. Oh, I knew you'd come, Dutch. She's beginning to change from this blonde, sex-starved vamp into a girl-next-door type of uh, figure that the public is beginning to buy and loves to see and which is actually closer to her own personality. While MGM has evidently no difficulty in finding roles that correspond to the personality of their actors, producer Irving Thalberg from Culver City Studio will relaunch William Powell's career in the same fashion. Irving Thalberg always wanted to say, that one wasn't used just right. 
I know what we could do with him. MGM signed him and put him in what they thought was a low-budget movie called The Thin Man they shot in three weeks, which became a sensation. It was the biggest sleeper hit of the year. Shh. I'm working on a case. Don't tell me you've gone back to detective work. I thought you had turned respectable. Didn't you get married? Oh, didn't I? Vance, I married a girl in a million. It was a Dashiell Hammett detective novel, but what MGM chose to do was to, to make it a story about a happily married couple. And that was a shock to the system. Hollywood had made lots of money by showing unhappily married couples. So it was thought that, you know, you didn't want to show a happily married couple unless you're suggesting that there's trouble ahead. It's very light. It's very quick on its feet. Uh, there's a lot of jokes about drinking and alcoholism. Hello there. Hello. Uh, another glass. How are you? Prohibition had just been repelled when the movie was produced. And so I think audiences kind of reveled in the fact that the characters were all slightly tipsy and slightly intoxicated. And it kind of made them feel a little bit intoxicated as well. And who better to play a tippling, uh, very suave, very urbane amateur private eye than uh, William Powell? Yeah, there were all kinds of sequels to The Thin Man. Yeah, the audience is lined up because they wanted to see Nick and Nora solving crimes and swigging martinis again. Who can blame them? So suddenly, William Powell is a bigger star than he's ever been. And he's an MGM star, which is the most prestigious studio in the world. If on the career front, everything is going well for Jean Harlow, in matters of the heart, she becomes entangled in a complicated affair with boxer Max Baer. He was brought to Hollywood to make a movie about a boxer. They were going to use his celebrity and make a movie about it. And he took one look at Jean Harlow and went after her, and she didn't run away. After Paul Byrne, it was a real change of pace. You had a brawny, totally physical guy who had a great personality and was arrogant and sexually aggressive. And so they started this affair, and Max Baer was married. In order to get out of this situation, because the rumors were that Max Baer's wife was going to press charges against Jean Harlow, for uh, messing around with her husband. And the studio arranged this marriage to her cameraman, Hal Rawson. Here comes Jean with her husband, Hal Rawson, who also happens to be her favorite cameraman. He's there and he's available, and it's a solution. In Hollywood at that time, the 1930s, the studios were like totalitarian states. They ran your life. In ending her relationship with Max Baer, Jean Harlow succumbed yet again to the pressure of the studio. The marriage to Hal Rawson, you know, was not a love match, really. He was dazzled by her, who wouldn't be? She liked him, but there was no passion. Her marriage to Hal Rawson, which was her third marriage, lasted eight months, but that was only officially, till they officially separated. It was essentially over in two months. Here we have a young woman, uh, let's say in mid-1935, and she still really hasn't found herself. She starts gambling and drinking. And that's how Jean Harlow begins to cope with her very stressful life. So she starts to rebel. Determined to take charge of her life, Jean Harlow no longer wants MGM to impose itself on her private life. And yet it is within the studio, a hive where everyone knows each other, that she meets, in late 1934, the new man of her life, William Powell. She was visiting the set of Manhattan Melodrama to see Clark Gable, and there's William Powell working with him. So he dates Jean Harlow, and Gene Harlow starts to fall for William Powell. He is 19 years her senior. He is seduced by her innocence, and she is fascinated by his assertiveness. Soon, they become inseparable. 
Jean Harlow feels she has finally found everything she's looking for. He's older, he's wiser, he's got his own career, his own money, his own ego. He looks enough like her father, but he's not her father. And she just worshipped him right from the start. She called him Poppy, and she thought, this is Mr. Right. Am I? When I'm in love, I'm reckless. Once there was a public romance between two of MGM's most important stars, there was no way they weren't going to take advantage of it and make money off of it. So they made a film called Reckless, which was meant for Joan Crawford. But they decided, well, we'll put her in it because William Powell's in it. And they wanted to exploit that romance. <laughs> Huh? Simply swell. Maybe you were never better. So that was their first film acting together after they had been dating for about four or five months. And, you know, they obviously have a chemistry on screen. Um, and you can see that, that, you know, they really cared for one another. Yeah. For the first time in my life, I'm scared. Now, baby, take it easy. Get out and stay out! Nevertheless, their romance is just about to get complicated. He had already had a marriage to a blonde bombshell, Carol Lombard, and he didn't want to be married to a, a sex symbol as it was, so I think that sort of turned him off with her being so similar a public figure as Carol Lombard. And it ate her up inside because acting didn't really matter. It, it had never really mattered. She liked it, she was good at it, but it wasn't what she ever wanted. And she was ready to leave her own career, marry him, have children. It was her dream. And Jean Harlow said, well, I'll leave. I don't need to be a movie star. But Jean Harlow's mother said, oh, yes, you do. We today can look at this relationship and see how toxic it was, see how, un how unhealthy it was. But to many people then, it seemed very devoted. And in that era, a loving mother and daughter was a virtue. Mama Jean isn't the only thing keeping Jean Harlow and William Powell apart. There's also Marino Bello, the stepfather. Jean Harlow is this huge star, and she has absolutely no money because her mother and stepfather are controlling all the money. It's absolutely true that William Powell investigated Marino Bello. Here he's got all these supposed mines in Mexico that aren't producing any money, and William Powell did these investigations to show Gene, look, they're throwing your money away. They're ruining everything that you're working so hard for. William Powell looked at Marino Bello, and he saw him for what he was, which was a lying, phony, using, manipulative, exploitative loser. So. Jean Harlow's mother divorces this Marino Bello. They sell the house, the, this very expensive white house that Jean Harlow's mother had built with the, the wicked stepfather. And they move to a smaller house in Beverly Hills. So on one hand, William Powell succeeded because he broke up that marriage. But on the other hand, it was an even bigger failure because once Jean Harlow's mother divorced Marino Bello, she had one focus in life, and only one focus in life, and that was her daughter. William Powell and Jean Harlow meet again for a new film, Libeled Lady. I tell you, I can't go now. The paper's in a jam. We're facing a libel suit. Well, you're facing a breach of promise suit. If you don't want to marry me, just say so. I'm glad you're getting yourself all upset, darling, over here at Little Drinky Man. No, not today I don't. Today I get married. Jean Harlow really wanted to be engaged to William Powell. He gave her a star sapphire ring, very much like the one he'd given Carol Lombard. But 
there was no engagement. So she called it the, the unengagement ring. But she still wore it as if it were an engagement ring, but he would not say, we're engaged. And this started to, to gnaw at her. He didn't break up with her, but he didn't marry her. So he was playing with the idea of marriage without actually committing. And he was dangling Jean Harlow. No, Jean Harlow and William Powell never lived together. They kept their own residences. Jean still lived with her mother, and William Powell had his own home. Although uh, Jean Harlow and William Powell would spend much time together at his place, or they would go on trips to Yosemite, and they would go out quite a bit. She had an abortion in May of 1936, which was William Powell's child, the child she always wanted. But she wasn't married, so she couldn't have the child. And that was when she really gave up. You can see it. While William Powell was getting recognition for two successful films, My Man Godfrey and Ziegfeld Follies, Jean Harlow is close to shooting Saratoga with her longtime friend Clark Gable. But the Jean Harlow that once sparkled didn't seem to glow anymore, replaced by a shadow of what once was. She had a portrait session with George Harrell, and he could see something was not right. He said that. Her, the shape of her body was different. She seemed like she had kind of, some kind of bloating and that she tired easily, didn't have much stamina and just seemed kind of detached and a little bit sad. So that was in, I think, mid-April. Then she started right after that, or like a week later, she started working on Saratoga. And it was a pretty demanding role, but um, she just had a harder and harder time getting to the studio on time and staying the whole day, and she just was, was deteriorating. During the scene shootings, Gene actually collapsed in his arms, and this not only happened with uh, Clark Gable, but with Walter Pidgeon as well. And they said, baby's not well. And uh, they would take her to her dressing room to rest. And she finally felt so bad that she said, I have to go home, which she had never done before. She was a total professional. And leaving a set in the middle of production, she felt terrible about it. But her face was sweaty. And she went home to her mother's. And for the next week, there were reports in the newspapers, she's sick, she's getting better, she's sicker. No, she's improving. A lot of people believe that she wasn't taken to the hospital right away because of Mama Jean's association with Christian science uh, religion, which promoted more of a spiritual healing. But I think this was sort of more of a, of a rumor because Mama Jean had actually hired nurses and there was um, a doctor's visit to the house. The problem was they misdiagnosed her. They didn't see that this was kidney failure. They thought it was something else. And the body, the, the kidneys are, are failing. They can't get the toxins out or the fluid out. So she's, you know, it's, it's just, she starts to have brain fever. And on June 3rd, she was admitted to uh, the Good Samaritan Hospital in Los Angeles. And when she checked in, it was quite common knowledge that among the staff, they, they said she wasn't going to make it. They said that she was pretty far gone. William Powell, who hasn't made an appearance until this point, finally visits her at the hospital. When Jean Harlow left the set that last week in 1937 in May, she went to William Powell's set before she left MGM to tell him, I'm going home now. I don't feel well. And he said he would visit her. But he dated other women that week, and he thought she had the flu, and it would be fine. And he didn't realize how sick she was, because when he went to the hospital, he saw this dying woman. And he realized what was happening.
A few hours later, on June 7, 1937, Jean Harlow dies. She was only 26 years old. When the funeral was held at Forest Lawn on June 9th, in the morning there were 200 invited guests and the services were held at the wee Kirk of the Heather at Forest Lawn and many stars uh, uh, appeared there and the fans were kept out at the main gate of Forest Lawn was closed. On the casket there was a card from William Powell that said, good night, my dearest darling. People told me that at Jean Harlow's funeral, William Powell had a, a physical breakdown. He was crying so hard, his body was shaking and he collapsed as his mother is escorting him. And you can see it in the photographs. Jean Harlow's mother selected a $30,000 crypt, a mausoleum for three people her daughter, herself, and presumably William Powell. Beautiful space still today. And then she announced to the press that William Powell was paying for it. That day at MGM Studios, one minute of silence was observed. But business is just about to resume. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the management of this theater, I want to announce the next attraction, the unfinished love story. I refer to Saratoga, starring Clark Gable and Jean Harlow. The picture which the theater goers of the world have insisted through letters, telegrams, and petitions be finished. Their first plans were to scrap the film, but there was such a public outcry that the fans wanted to see Jean Harlow in her last film. And I'm sure the studio saw quite a opportunity to have a big hit by doing this film. But the problem was what, how to finish a film without, with your main star as, as died. Now, MGM was left in a very odd position with, with her death. I mean, to have a film that's about three quarters finished, but the, the scenes that need to be shot are crucial scenes that are gonna resolve the story. Saratoga, the motion picture everyone is talking about, has been finished through ingenious camera work by Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's ace photographers and the determination of the producers to make this, Miss Harlow's last picture, her finest. A great production awaits your approval. They came up with this idea of using a double for Jean Harlow and they filmed the back of another actress's head during key scenes, and they dubbed her speaking roles. But Saratoga was a huge, huge success because people wanted to see Jean Harlow one last time. But William Powell won't attend the premiere of Saratoga. He left for Europe to forget, to mourn. Far from Hollywood, he realizes how much he regrets what fleeting opportunities he hadn't seized during his romance with Jean Harlow. In his head, it's his fault. He's blaming himself. He's thinking she died of a broken heart. So in that sense, he had good reason to feel guilty because he did break her heart. And it changed him as a person, by all accounts, the people who knew him said, because right after she died, he became very, very sick. He had rectal cancer, and he was off the screen for two years. When he did marry, he married a minor actress who'd been in a couple, very few films, uh, Diana Lewis. And then she promptly retired and became his wife. That was it. And she was much younger than he was, too. And they stayed married for the rest of his life. He got what he needed. He found the type of woman he needed. Retired from the movie industry in the mid-50s, William Powell dies on March 5th, 1984, at 92 years old in Palm Springs. I don't think he ever forgot Jean Harlow. His widow told me that he would not discuss her, that it was too painful. I think she was the love of his life, and, and I think he was the love of her life.
The name of William Powell remains forever associated with that of Jean Harlow. Ten years of career were enough for the 30 star to become an icon. And her premature death transformed her life into legend.